Those at the uh, back of the room, um, the white ones on this end of the table, a single pile, they're mine. <laughs> All the others are red. <laughs> mine are also on the thumb drive. So if you've got that, you don't want to carry paper around, you're uh, quite welcome to do that. So I'd like to get started. You get something up there all the time. It's not on your screen, though. Okay. Has everybody got a copy of mine on the white paper? Smooth operator, very fast. It doesn't really matter at this point whether you do. Let me uh, kick off the, uh, the official thing here. Read the words that I'm required to read as moderator. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Had to read that one. Welcome to the 43rd Colorado Convention in Norfolk, Virginia. Today is the 21st of March, and this is the Smooth Operator Session. My name is Mary Klasper, and uh, I'm acting as the moderator for this session, although I'll do some babbling as well. And uh, my uh, colleague is the notorious Ed Wood. Ed and I have an interesting relationship, so you'll probably see a few parts like that fly back and forth. Um, Ed is uh, well known for his uh, choreographic excellence. Uh, he was chairman of the Color Lab of the uh, Challenge Committee for 30 years. And I followed him into that billet. And that was really daunting, thinking, well, the guy that was preceded me had been there for 30 years. <laughs> um, so the two of us are going to be talking about um, how to develop smooth choreography. Now, this is part of a discussion on smooth dancing. How do you create a smooth dancing experience? And a smooth dancing experience involves a lot of things. We're not going to talk about all of them. So as a smooth dancing experience, it, it may have at its base or its starting point, the way you've assembled the columns and whether they actually fit well together. But of course, just as important or even more important is the way you deliver that choreography. So you can deliver smooth choreography badly and it still isn't going to be smooth. To some extent, you can rescue bad choreography with a good presentation you know, by putting the hesitations in the right place, filler words, and keeping the energy up. But at some point, if you've got really bad choreography, a smooth delivery actually makes it worse. Because if, you, if you've got a lot of really horrible feeling stuff, but you deliver it quickly and smoothly, man, that's going to be bad. We're not going to be talking about any of the presentation elements. What we're talking about is strictly the components of the choreography themselves. So how you put the calls together, the calls that you choose to string together and in what order, that is the element of smooth dancing that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to get my notes here to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, as soon as we start, start talking about designing choreography, thinking about choreography ahead of time, how many of you are sight callers or regard yourself as sight callers primarily? And how many of you uh, are module callers primarily, and, and or mix the two? And how many of you think about creating that choreography ahead of time? So some of you like your modules, or you sit down and push checkers through flow modules that you use in your site calling. Do all that. So you're, you're thinking ahead of time, I am designing my choreography. When I use that phrase, a lot of people automatically go to it's pre-written stuff that you're going to read. And especially since I'm uh, primarily a challenge caller, when people hear me say that, they automatically assume that I'm talking about pre-written choreography that somebody's going to read. We are not talking about that specifically. It doesn't matter how you create or design the choreography or how you deliver it. These principles apply. You need to be thinking about the elements that we're going to talk about 
regardless of how this choreography got generated, whether you just plot it up on the fly as you were crawling to the floor, or whether you're sitting in your living room writing cards you're going to read two months later. I do that. So, there's a secret. I'm going to read you the secret for smooth choreography. Smooth choreography features movement with transfers of momentum that feel natural and pleasant. That's it. That's the whole thing. You may leave now. <laughs> so what we're really going to be talking about today is we're going to kind of take that statement apart. I mean, that's it. That's really it. That's all we're talking about is how you string calls together so that you've got movement with transfers of momentum that feel natural and pleasant. Of course, when you start really looking at those words, like so much of the things that we say, what does that really mean? You know, what is natural? What is pleasant? What is a transfer of momentum? What, what do those words mean? Um, so we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be unpacking that statement. Is that their analysis of what we're going to do? Are you paying attention to that? <laughs> Un unpacking, is that too big a word? Yes, that's Ed, Ed and I have a thing going. Those of you who have maybe read a little bit of my handout, um, I actually ran that through a grade level thing because Ed said too many big words, too many big words. It comes out of grade 10. So any of you who have a high school education should be fine. But uh, I'm known for using big words, you know, like marmalade, linoleum, and things like that. So, so Ed and I have a, have a different philosophy of the way handouts are supposed to work. Um, those of you who do have my hand out in front of you, don't look at it. My philosophy of handouts is there's something you take back with you, and hopefully, something of what I actually say in front of you will remain some sort of residue in your mind. And then, when you go and look at the handout, you can study it in detail and hopefully get good stuff out of it for some time. And really, the presentation is a way to help you understand the handout. But I'm not going to be reading from it or doing chapter and verse of what you see in the handout, so don't feel like you need to be following along. Ed, um, on the other hand, believes that handouts are kind of like point form summaries of what's being covered, so that you can go back and remember, hopefully, what was said. We have different philosophies, so that's why you get different handouts. <coughs> really need to say all of that, but there you are. So, let's look at unpacking that statement, what the, uh, what is a smooth transfer of momentum, what is the transfer of momentum, period, um, and what is natural, and what feels good. So, there's a few things that anybody who's been to a color school, how many of you have been to at least one color school? That's good. Sometimes you get an embarrassing answer when you answer that question, answer that, or ask that question. Um, you'll have heard the elements of this. You know, there are things that are just naturally bad that you don't do. So none of this is going to come as a surprise. However, when you actually start poking at it, you find that, that it's not as easy as it looks. There are things that we do which after you list all the no-nos, these are the things you should never do, you can identify choreography that we use all the time, well-respected, nationally known colors that violate some of these no-nos. So how can that be? Well, the answer is we acclimatize the answers to doing certain things which are, in fact, not inherently smooth. Um, and they get used to doing it, and they figure out how to do it and make it not just look smooth, but feel smooth. They, they will tell you that you use the combination all the time. We, you know, we do that all the time. And actually, there are other things which, according to theory, should be smooth. And they turn out to not feel great at all. So this is very much an art. Um, there are certainly some rules you can articulate, things to try and keep in mind, but you can often find exceptions to whatever we whatever we two are going to say up here. So, 
first no-no that you're all familiar with is abrupt reversals of direction are not good. So by that we mean things like if you're moving sideways, the next move better not take you back. And of course, we all know movements that do exactly that. And in fact, when you're doing other kinds of dancing, that sort of thing happens all the time. You know, two sideward, two step, go back. So how can that be bad? Well, the difference is that when you're expecting the change of motion, you take appropriate action to stop your momentum, take a beat, reverse your momentum. So the fact that you change direction isn't the issue, it's the abrupt change of direction without notice, where the dancer has no way to prepare themselves for that change of direction. So it's the abruptness with no ability to, to compensate for the fact that you are now reversing your momentum that makes it feel bad. Um, if you think about what's one of the first things you do even at a party gun? Join hands, circle to the left, and then we teach them Alamein left. What does that feel like for the girls? Right? The girls have been moving to their left. The corner's over here. So how do they adjust for that? And brand new dancers will do this. The girls stop, brace on that leg, and then turn to their corner. And when we call it, if we know what we're doing, we give them the music to do that. We let them take the beats, to do what that's a basketball turn or something that those of you round dance will you seem to remember that in my round dancing days 35 years ago. Um, so dancers compensate for a lot of these reversals of motion that we put in there if they know they're going to happen. If they know it's coming, then they will compensate for us. But if they don't know it's coming, it feels terrible. Or if they expect that they're actually going to keep moving in that direction, then we force them to move. We don't give them music to do some sort of a basketball turn kind of thing. Then it will feel terrible. Centers of rotation are another thing that are really important. So how many centers of rotation dancers usually work in? You know what I mean by a center of rotation? No. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm moving around some center point. So, like, here's, here's a spot on the carpet. So, I'm moving around it like this. That's a, a center of rotation. How often do we ask dancers to do that? Lots of calls. Circle left. It's around a center of rotation. Touch a quarter. Center of rotation. So we ask dancers to rotate around the center quite often. Now what happens if you reverse that rotation? So if you did, I'm trying to think of one that's really ugly. Man line, bend the line. Well, it depends on where the bend line comes from, right? It depends on where the man line comes from. So let's, let's imagine Right, that we're in, in right hand waves. I'm a boy on the end. Waves over there. So the example that somebody just showed up there is one of the collar school goodies that we always lay out there, right? And run, send the rotations around here, bend the line, I'm required to back up. So that's an abrupt reversal of, of a rotation. Feels terrible. New callers do it all the time because they they're only usually paying attention to one person that they're tracking is them. They don't realize that other people in the square are doing this really ugly thing. So it's a common mistake that new callers make. But that's an example of a very abrupt reversal of a rotation. I was moving this way, I'm moving forward that way, and you make me back up. It's important to remember that there are four possible centers of rotation. So, squared up set, joint hand circle left. Where's the center of rotation? 
the very center of the set, right? Everybody's moving around that same center. Box of four. Join hands, circle left quarter. Where's the center of rotation? In the center of the box of four. Think about doing a right and left through. Right full line, courtesy turn is a rotation. Where's the center of rotation? It's in between the two people. You turn back. Where's the center of rotation? Right through the axis of the dancer. All of those motions around the center are feelings of momentum that the dancers have. And the thing about rotations is, if you do them too much, it feels bad. If you abruptly reverse them, it feels bad. So how the hell do you get out of them once you've got them going? So it's important to have ways to change the way the rotation is working. And you can do that one of two ways. So you can think about something like, if, say we've just done a right and left through or a ladies chain or something, and we've got a courtesy turn going, what is often called, we've got this really powerful rotation going to our left. People will often do something like pass through. Right? You'll just break that rotation, turn, it, turn this turning motion into a straight ahead motion. So that's one way to break it. Another way to break it is to maybe convert the turning motion into a lateral motion. So the way we do that sometimes is we might say something like, after the right and left through, assuming standard lines, ladies walk, boys dodge. So the ladies walk straight ahead, they broke the rotation by walking forward, the boys broke it by stepping sideways. Everybody see that? I'm talking about. So that was a way of transferring the momentum that they built up in the rotation into some other form of motion, but in a way that didn't require them to abruptly change the direction of the rotation and reverse themselves. So those are sort of the two ways out of a rotation. Another thing to be aware of with rotations is that, as I said, if you do too much in the same direction, around the same center of rotation, you get overflow. We're all familiar with that, right? The answer's complaining, I'm being scrubbed into the ground. And uh, particularly, those of us who rely a lot on sight can do that very easily, because we tend to be focusing on a few people in the square, and it's easy to forget, oh, I just turned that lady around in the same direction five times in a row. It's easy to, to miss that when you're focused on somebody else. So you need to, to come up with ways to automatically change the, the direction of rotation or change the center of rotation. So a common example of changing the direction of rotation in a way that feels comfortable is by doing something like, say you do a flutter wheel, and you move into a reverse flutter wheel. And why does that feel good? Because there's lots of momentum in the direction to doing the reverse. You're sweeping this way, then the boy hears the reverse coming, knows that he's not going to keep moving like this. He's going to transfer that vector of motion inward, take a left hand with the other boy, bring him back, bring the girl back. So it, the dancers hear it coming, they know that they're going to get music that lets them step to change the direction that they're moving comfortably and bring the girl back. So that's an example of changing the momentum of the rotation into an opposite rotation. So there are ways to do that. You can change the center of the rotation. So if we do something like um, if, if we do something like a wheel and deal, so think of a two-phase line. So 
So we're doing the wheel and deal. We've got a center of rotation around there. The wheel and deal kind of automatically breaks that center as, as the people face one another. And then we do a sweep of order, very common. And the center of rotation changed from being between the pairs that were in the line that was doing the wheel and deal to being in the center of the box. So the dancers see that as a change of focus and a change of rotational center. And even though you haven't really you're still got a center between the same four people, it's in a different place between the same four people. There are calls that automatically change the center of rotation for you. So think about swing through. Swing through has center of rotation around the first pair that trades, different center of rotation around the second pair that trades. So automatically you've moved that center of rotation that the dancers have in their head. And they perceive that as a change of momentum. But you have actually managed to, to break one momentum or replace it with another momentum. The example that I just gave with swing through um, brings us to another point. I've talked about all these changes that you want to try and create in the momentums that you set up. All the things that I've said can be bad, can be made good, if you've got some way for the dancers to get some support in making that change. And one of the biggest supports we can give them is to let them have some kind of a handhold where they can use the other dancers' presence and weight to help change their momentum. So if you think about us, what happens with a swing through, that really shouldn't feel good. I mean, if you did a swing through without hands, the people coming into the center, are, they're turning this way, right? So the first hand has them turning this way, and then you're going to ask them to turn that way. If you ask them to do that without hands, it doesn't feel near as good as the actual call does. Because the call involves having a handhold, that person there gives you somebody that you can use as an anchor, and you together feel much more comfortable going around that handle, exerting some leverage against one another. So having given dancers the ability to have some leverage to give weight, something that we're finding is less and less common on dance floors. It seems that people are not being taught this kind of stuff at the same point that when you're dancing, you're actually expected to use the other person's presence to help you do things. I think Ed is going to talk a lot more about this. He's going to introduce the idea of teaching dancers styling to help them with their uh, ability to dance smoothly. So that is an important, very important element in helping dancers dance smoothly, making sure that you give them opportunities to exert leverage. This is an, an interesting uh, case of where something that shouldn't feel good, we do all the time, dancers smooth it right up. Think about the call. So I'm the end of a right hand wave as a boy. Swing through. Boys run. How many of you called that? You didn't hold up your hand, you're lying. <laughs> That's one of those combinations that dancers will sometimes do without you even calling it. You call the swing through and you get boys run before you can get it up. Why does that feel good? And if you ask the dancers, they'll say, that, that feels good, but look what happened to the boy. He came in, turned for, by the left, he had a fairly powerful turning motion in towards the center of that line. And now you're asking him, unsupported, right? he's got no leverage with this hand, to change that direction and go over to his right. Should feel pretty bad. But they'll tell you, oh, that feels fine, we do that all the time. It's because this is where presentation can smooth out what should be inherently bad. Because how do you deliver that? You say, swing through, boys run, and he hears run right about here. So when he does the run, he doesn't finish the swing through and sort of get that tight turning momentum into the turn. He starts to smooth it out about here. And so he never actually finishes that turn. He starts to run like this. 
So he's act, he, you give him the opportunity to transfer the momentum that he has into the direction that he actually needs to go. Gets a couple of beats of music, gets steps that feel comfortable. So that's another thing that when we give dancers combinations that they're used to, even if they have some elements in them which theoretically shouldn't be good, they will figure out a way to make them good. And we've got a lot of choreography that works that way. Is there anything more? Anything wrong with that? Or is that good? I'm saying we make it good. What I'm saying is that there's a difference between theory and practice. Okay. The difference between theory and practice is less than theory than the difference between theory and practice and practice. You know that? In other words, what you think of in your living room sometimes is going to be different when the dancers do it. And sometimes it's different good, and sometimes it's different bad. Because they're used to doing that. And so they make it smooth. So that if they have to do it all the time, they're not going to do it so that it feels crappy. Which brings me to the next element, which is when you're designing choreography, so when you're sitting in your living room and you're designing a module, here's the calls that I'm going to put together. You're probably pushing checkers or something, right? Or you're, if you're using a computer, you're using one of the checker mover programs. So your view of the square when you're doing that is you're looking down from above at whatever it is you're using to represent the dancers. So you may have dolls or checkers or packets or whatever it is you use. Those things you're using to represent the dancers aren't shaped the same way the dancers are. So it's easy when you're pushing your checkers around to lose track of what it actually feels like to the dancers. So you have to be mindful of that as you're designing your choreography. So what I'm talking about is things like, imagine I'm standing in a right-hand column. I got somebody right there by the hand. Look how close they are. If you ask them to face in, do they stand that close? No, they'll back up when you ask them to face in. Because everybody wants to have a little personal space there. So they're different, but if you look at the spots on the floor that your checkers are sitting in, they're the exact same spots on the floor. So theoretically, this is the same as that, but it ain't. The people aren't going to behave that way. So as you're putting your choreography together, you have to be thinking to yourself all the time, if I'm in this square, in this formation, what does it really feel like to do this movement? So for instance, when we do things like from a lady's chain from lines, the lines are this far apart, there's room for the ladies to get in there fairly comfortably, and the boys can back up, give them a little more room, we see that happening all the time, and they do the courtesy turn. You do that same call from an eight chain, and even though the distance between the dancers is the same, right, because they're still facing one another, so they'll maintain that kind of distance. The fact that there's, if I'm in the center, there's people behind me, makes me feel like I, I find the boy, I can't back up and give the girls room. The boy on the outside usually is too dumb to back up more and give them room. So the girls feel crowded as they go in. And that's one of the reasons we we don't call ladies changes flat-footed from an age chain. We may do it if we proceeded it with something else that's generated that room. So you might do something like a right and left through followed by a ladies chain. Why does that work better? Because the right and left through followed partly through the courtesy turn, the dancers have all breathed outwards, made enough room so that by the time they finish the courtesy turn and they haven't breathed back, they actually have a comfortable space to do the ladies chain. So when you're, dance, when you're designing your choreography, you have to be thinking about that kind of stuff. What is it actually going to feel like? Which means you have to know what it's actually going to feel like. How do you do that? You dance. One of the ways, in fact, the only real way that I know to 
get your arms around this kind of stuff is to go and dance to people who are known for smooth choreography and take note of what they're doing, what they're putting together, and what they don't put together. And that's how you start to develop your own assessment of what's going to work smoothly. So I think at this point I'm going to stop talking because Ed's going to sleep back there. I can hear him. And uh, I'll ask Ed to, he's got a bunch more remarks. I'll let him introduce what he's going to be doing himself. That's good because I didn't have any answers. <coughs> okay, uh, first of all, you saw the handouts back there. They're all primarily for dancers. There's only one, I think, that really pertains only to college. Everything there, feel free, if you like what's on any of those handouts, feel free to make copies and give them out anyway. I set all those out at the various dances I call. Uh, they're there because it's information for we as callers to tell the dancers, but it's also good for the dancers to have this material and, and be looking at it. So feel free to make copies of anything you want. We'll look at some specific things on choreography for smoothness in a, in a few minutes here. But first, I wanted to, um, what, what are the biggest impediments to smooth dancing? Now, Barry in his handout, in the first or second paragraph, he lists several things. All of those are true. In my opinion, there are two primary things that are the biggest impediment to smooth dancing. One is timing, and we know that's a factor with new callers, because they don't know where a call, when a call ends, so they, they have to physically see it end. So the call star through, oh, okay, it ends there, now I'll give the next call. Of course, that's stop start. So bad timing is a big impediment to smooth dancing. And second, degree of difficulty. We've all heard that phrase. If the material is too difficult, that's going to impede on, on, the, on the smoothness of dancing. Uh, this leads, those, so those are the two that I feel are the biggest drawbacks to smooth dancing. Timing, bad timing, and material that's too difficult. This leads us right into our next top topic of momentum. We want smooth flowing all the time, called wind in your face. Things that the dancers are comfortable with. So swing through, boys run, couples circulate. Things that are, just let the dancers dance without thinking. However, we all want to use some occasional creative choreography in our, in our calling. So then the question becomes, how much of our dance should be just momentum, wind in your face, and how much should be creative choreography? Because granted, on creative choreography, we're going to have dancers stopping occasionally. Uh, it's going to be not quite as smooth flowing. But uh, as Barry said, we don't want constant smooth flow all the time. That just is too much for the dancers. So how much of your dance should be creative choreography? There's a standard percent that's been tossed around for a number of years. Anybody know that figure? 80%. 80% should be standard. 80% should be standard. I'm going to set it back. Creative choreography, only 20%. Standard choreography, wind in your face, 80%. And if you have a week four, it's 90%. Week four is 90%. In other words, creative choreography is the icing on the cake, but it is not the cake. And if we try to make it the cake, then it doesn't sell. And over the years, there have been uh, excellent choreographers that uh, try to make it the cake. And for the most part, they have a home program for people like this, and they haven't traveled much because they, they haven't their material doesn't sell at the mainstream and plus it because they try to make the material the cake. So remember on momentum, all whenever you're thinking smoothness and you're asking, is my dance tonight smooth smooth enough? Think wind in your face and call nothing, just call all standard material. So those are two things that we as callers can do to make smooth dancing. Good timing combined with uh, 
material that isn't too difficult, and also momentum. Now there are some things that the dancers need to do to make, them, to make smooth dancing. And if the dancers don't do this, then we can have the greatest material in the world and the dancers are going to say, gee, it was an awkward dance, and it's their fault. So for the dancers, the dancers must be taught two things. Number one, take hands. We all know that. Orders of the dancers to take hands. But take hands is vital because if the dancers don't take hands, they're just kind of like independent little people out there. They must take hands, and you must get them to take hands. And this needs to start in beginner's class. We have to create a mindset in the dancers that it's very important to take hands. So I tell the dancers, whenever a call is completed, you have to, take, you have to join hands in one second. Now that gets their attention. One second, I think that means he wants me to do it kind of fast. If they take two seconds, I don't care. But I planted the seed of the mindset that it's vital to take hands immediately. Where do we do this? We do, we start a beginner's class. We start a beginner's class because it has to be repeated over and over again. And the reason in our travels, on a travel, I do traveling around the country, I see dancers not taking hands. Why? Because it hasn't been emphasized in beginner's class. You ask any caller in the world, do you teach dancers in your beginner's class to take hands? They'll say yes. And they're telling the truth. They do. They do mention it once a night or twice a night. It is so important it has to be mentioned over and over again. And a very effective way to do this without hitting them over the head is, for instance, facing lines. If I call past you and I see somebody doesn't have hands joined, I'll just stop and I'll start to count. One, two, three, four. They go, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm counting the number of seconds it takes everybody to take hands. When the hands really go out. Now the next time I do it, maybe I only get to two. One, two, oh, that means everybody looks around. Who doesn't have hands? So I come at the back door with them. I haven't hit them over the head and say, well, you've got to take hands because I'm a caller and I'm the king and I said you got to do it. No, we come in the back door to emphasize how important this is. Let me just check to make sure I haven't left anything out here. Uh, also, uh, dancers have to be trained how to physically move their bodies around the floor. Taking hands is one of those things. There's one handout back there for dancers called How to Save Your Square. Four key steps for dancers to know. Now we as callers can tell them, but we can't stand up there every night and say this. Give that to your dancers. This is, these are the secret hints for how dancers can, on their own, be the savior of their square. Second, dancers in moving themselves around the floor, they have to have the big picture. They, they have to have the gestalt. <laughs> so, two syllables. I'm trying, yeah, but it's a big word. <laughs> See, I've learned this, based on, based on some of the things Barry wrote, I came up with the thing, it's, a, it's axiomatic to be ubiquitous. <laughs> See, I learned that, I learned that. Uh, so as dancers are moving around the floor, they should always have their head turned toward the center of the set, wherever they are, because they want them to see the big picture. What we don't want dancers to have is tunnel vision, where they're just looking straight ahead. So dancers should always be dancing with their head slightly turned at a 30 degree angle. Always have the big picture. That way, say somebody on the other side of the square is having trouble, you can signal them, turn around or turn that way, uh, and you can help save the square. So, how dancers dance is vital to whether what we call is going to be smooth, and we have to show them how to dance and tell them how to dance. And, and so, again, I encourage you to pass out that literature back there. There's another aspect to smooth dancing, and that is. Dancers 
may say they know how to do a call, but they do it badly. They you know, any plus stance. You know how to load the boat? Uh, yeah, I know how to load the boat. And you watch them do it. You watch the centers that are bumping each other and they're late and all over the place. You know, it's been change, change of gears. Oh, yeah, I know how to do that. But that lone outside dancer, when they turn back and they try to make the star, they just turn back and then they have to over like this. They're tilted at a 45 degree angle and they're turning the star that way. The key is that they have to know to slide in and make the star. They also have to know they better, better get their hand in there fast because the centers aren't going to wait for them. The centers are too involved thinking about themselves. These are the little gremlins that slip in that the dancers don't even realize they're not doing. That's on a handout back there. Give the dancers that there's a handout on the secret hints for dancing has been changing, changing years. So give that to the dancers. So that's all introduction then to uh, looking at some choreography. My notes, so I don't forget anything. Oh, so now we're into choreography. There's a handout back there entitled Bad Choreography. 150 things you never want to call. It's broken into sections. Blatantly awful bad, sort of bad, overflow, words you don't want to say, and every item in there is not, don't call this because I said don't call it, though the reason, under each example, there's a reason, is shown why you don't call it. So every single example, there's commentary on why you don't call that piece of material. Now, don't memorize, try to memorize those 150 things, but read through it as kind of an example of choreography you shouldn't call. And, and, or or watch, how, watch how you're calling. I mean, obviously, double pass through centers in wheel and deal, nobody would call it. That's blatantly bad. And what Barry showed from, an end, uh, from Ocean Waves, ends run bent the line, that's blatantly bad. Uh, but look it over because there's some that aren't necessarily as bad, they kind of slip in. What about from, uh, if you're theming peel off, what about from facing lines? Touch a quarter and peel off. You know, callers call that, but it's blatantly awful for the lead person in the box to, to do that. So, specific examples of things you don't, you don't want to call. Very commonly used things that you don't want to call. These are all on that list. They might get lost in the shovel there. First of all, star through beer left. Place crack the whip with the girl. But the combination star through beer left, it's what I call a caller's call. Because I see, oh, I'm, I'm in the two-face line get out, so I see if I star through and veer left, I'm going to have a two-face line, so I can be right into my get out. Basic rule of thumb, we never sacrifice the dancers for our convenience. So we never call star through your life. Second, we've all heard walk and dodge partner trade. Whole world calls walk and dodge partner trade. See from what you call walk and dodge, as the girl's dodge and she's already turned to her left in anticipation of them. Partner trade. From ocean waves, the only smooth thing to call after walk and dodge is a chase right. So you say, well, gee, I'm, I'm calling mainstream, so I don't call chase, right? You mean I can't use walk and dodge at all? No, but don't do it from waves. I never call walk and dodge from waves, except on a plus stance when I'm going to call a chase, right? Because I know there's nothing smooth after it. I don't want to call the partner trade. So instead, I call, and let me see what I got here. Um, all right, let's get, let's get a square for this. Can I get a square? Now we're not going to be worried here about sight calling and going for corners. We're all in choreography here. Okay. Okay, so our blue man is a girl. Uh, so 
I said, we ne I never call walk and dodge from ways because I know the partner trade is not going to be good for the girl. By the way, it's unfortunate. In a lot of choreography, since the majority of callers are men, we just sacrifice the girls. We don't even think about the girls. There's a lot of stuff that we call that's fine for the men and is awkward for the girls. And this walk and dodge partner trade is a perfect example. So I said, I never call walk and dodge from waves, so where do I call it? Heads, uh, let's have the heads slide through. Yeah, go that way. Yeah, the heads, this way, even though I'm walking around. <laughs> so I call walk and dodge from a starting double pass through. Centers touch a quarter. Centers walk and dodge. Centers separate. Around one, make a line of four. Everybody star through. Centers slide through. Centers touch a quarter. Centers walk and dodge. Everybody do a right and left through. Veer to the left. Ferris wheel. Centers touch a quarter. Centers walk and dodge. Same people cloverly. New centers touch a quarter. You walk and dodge and you cloverly. All sorts of walk and dodges that I've never put them in a wave once. That's where I use walk and dodge. Consider doing that. Um, centers pass through. This has been kind of my pet peeve for a long time. The whole world calls those that know, make a wave and do something. Those that know, swing through. Are we aware that dosa do involves a double reversal of body flow? You're going forward, and then you're coming backward, and then you're going forward again for the next call. Now, granted, we try to we round it off, but it's a double reversal of body flow. So, to me, dosa do, there's a basic rule of thumb: the more dosa do's in your dance, the less smooth it is. I call one dosa do a night. And the only reason I do so is I want to see how many people do that Hungarian swing. This out of curiosity. Now the good news is in the last 10 years that swinging dose to dough has dropped considerably. I'm not sure why, but it's, that's wonderful. I never call dose to dough. The more dose to dough, the less smooth your dance. Also, uh, if you call dose to dough and then swing through, to me that's talking down to the dancers. I don't think you're good enough to do a facing couple swing through, so I'm going to do see do you into a wave first. So, consider how many dose of dos a night you're using, and consider whether you might want to consider lowering that. Uh, everybody start through. Here's a, co here's a combination that I see all the time. You see, written in written quarter, past the ocean, Recycle. So why was that bad? Who is it? Who is it bad for? The girls again. We have sacrificed the girls. Star through. Watch the girl's direction. The girl is turning to her left, and then she has to come back to her right to do the recycle. Past the ocean. Recycle. And even if we lead them in to say the recycle ahead of time. They're mentally thinking turning left, and so it's still going to feel feel awkward for them. You have a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on that. That's a perfect example of the difference between theory and practice. Because theory says when you do a pass the ocean, you pass through, you face in, and you touch. So, in other words, the girl didn't have any momentum towards the center of the wave in theory. But in practice, she feels like she's got a pretty powerful momentum towards the center of the wave. Again, that's another case where we do it all the time. You know, the, how many times do you see that combination? And the dancers have gotten used to smoothing it out for us. Okay, now the whole, this whole thing of bodies is bodies in motion. There's a word for this. It's called kinesiology. And kinesiology hey, is hey, a word. And uh, actually, Gloria Roth first pushed this. Canadian uh, caller from a long way back. All, all Canadians use big words. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Never thought about it. <laughs> I arguably agree with you. <laughs> uh, so it, the, the science of kinesiology involves bodies in motion. That's all it means. It's bodies in motion and how we move our bodies around. So let's do a star through, pass through, wheel and deal, and spread. And everybody pass through, wheel and deal. Girls pass through. We have a same sex eight chain through formation. In this setup, all sorts of callers will call to get out of this because they want to normalize for other Alabama or whatever. Don't do this. They'll call star through and then couple circulate, right? Well, of course, newer callers will call star through and bend the line, right? Well, watch, watch, uh, watch him. Star through and bend the line. He's going this way, he comes back. Okay, go back to that spot where you were. Girls and boys in the end. So we can't call, we don't want to call star through and bend the line. Do, what about if we call star through and couple circulate? Let's watch him. Star through and couple circulate. Well, he, his body motion for the star through is coming this way. He had to go back this way. So maybe we don't want to call a couple circulate after a star through. Uh, bend the line, pass through, wheel and deal, and spread. Pass through, wheel and deal. I want to get it set up so you're looking this way. Girls pass through. So we have the same setup for those that seen on MP3. Same sex eight chain through, girls in the middle. What about a uh, what about a star through wheel and deal? Same thing for this guy on the end and this guy on the end over here. A star through wheel and deal, his, his body motion is coming around to the right, but he has to reverse direction for the wheel and deal. The bottom line is that after a star through from a same sex eight chain through, all calls are bad. <laughs> I disagree. Except, <laughs> except if you put in a setter's tray. Now you might say, well, why do you say center's trade? Because we're looking at this guy again on the, on the outside right. If he does a star through center's trade, why is it the same thing? His star through motion has him going to the right and center's trade is going to have him come back to the left. Now we come back to the idea of, of bodies in motion. I won't use the big word. Bodies in motion are more stable the lower the center of gravity. So football players don't run standing up, they run crouched down. That lowers the center of gravity. When we do a star through, having the hands up, it raises the center of gravity. And when we call, insert a center's trade afterwards, it lowers the center of gravity. Star through, boys trade, and the couples circulate. Wasn't that smooth? Say yes. Good. And, and also, not only does it lower the center of gravity, it means that the reversal of direction is supported. The boys have a handhold. They can give weight to the other boy and help them change the momentum that they had from the star through. Bend the line. Pass through. Wheel and deal. And spread. Pass through. Wheel and deal. Zoom. And the boys pass through, so now we have the same sex eight chain through the boys and little girls at the end. Same thing here. This time, it's going to be the outside left girl that we're looking at. Now, by the way, when I call star through, and if I don't insert the center straight, it's only the next call is only going to be awkward for two people. The other six, if I call a couple circulator, wheel and deal, it's fine for the other six. The rule is. If it's awkward for anybody, it's no good for the whole square. So, star through, girls train, and the couple circulate. Bend the line. This is extremely important for smoothness in calling, and it isn't written down. People have said, why don't you write it down? Just haven't gotten around to it. Um, but it's been around for all the time. It was first, this theory was first proposed by Jack Lazary back in the 80s. 
He's the one that started this whole thing. Any comments or observations on this idea of Center's trade? Yep. Uh, if you need a mic, well. If you did a slide through instead of a star through, does that simplify anything or complicate it because they're not holding hands? It actually complicates it a little more because they aren't holding hands. But it's really the same thing, the same, same idea. It complicates it a lot more because you'll get a three in one alliance. <laughs> no, no, he's, at, at, least, least, at least half the square won't do it right. Oh, the oh, slide through from that set up, if you just do it without a lot of rehearsal, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah, say your, when you're on your mic too, the rule is we're supposed to say our name where we're from. So, I agree with you on the center's trade thing. Jack Oh, I'm sorry. Jack Platty Shows up as people <laughs> listen to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I totally agree, totally agree on the center's trade thing. And I use it all the time, but just watching you just now, it occurred to me, what's the difference between star crew and center's trade and star crew and circulate? They're still doing the same thing. Set it up, please. Yeah, we're yeah, really in the middle of uh, where we got a girl like a wheel and deal and spread. Pass through, wheel and deal. And the girls pass through, so we have the same so, sexy sheet. So if I do a, a star crew, okay, go ahead and do that. Star crew. Center's trade. All right? So I, I use that all the time. I got That's cool. But it just occurred to me, let's go back and set it up. Boys on the outside, girls in the middle. Star crew, watch the center, couple of circulate. He's still doing the center's trade. Because he he's doing it, but without hands. It, it, it just occurred to me the first time. It's oh, the yeah. same. That's that's just, but it's without hands. Great answer. That's, 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 that's the same motion, but it's Yes. I see the leverage, that's great. Okay, thank you. Bend the line. So the rule becomes, from same-sex eight chain through, if you call star through, you must call center's trade as the next call. You're required to do that. Pass the ocean. From parallel waves, and Barry used the example of M's run, this is the same thing from a different formation. If you have ends run, and sometimes new callers will call ends run because that will get them in two face lines with their with the boy girl setup. From parallel ways, if you call ends run, the next call must be center straight. It absolutely must be for the exact same reasons as we just showed from the from the uh, same sex eight chain through. Boys run, boys trade. And the couple circulate. If we didn't put that boys trade in there, we put any other call, bend the line, uh, if we put any other call in there, it's going to be unsmooth. Now, coming back to the idea that as male callers, we sacrifice the girls, what happens on the call past the ocean? The uh, uh, very pointed out about past the ocean swing through boys run that the boys run should be awkward but the boys are so used to doing it they or yeah swing through boys run it should be awkward but it isn't well let's look at this what happens on past the ocean what's the definition of past the ocean it's pass through make a military 90 degree turn to the to face the center of the box and then step straight ahead to a wave but nobody dances it says this way right it's all dances, the girls all blend into it. Watch the girls blend past the ocean. They're all blending. A lot of girls take hands as they're blending in there. So nobody dances the call past the ocean the way it's written with the definition. Everybody does this other way. So if you want your dance to be smooth, you better adjust to how the dancers are doing it, or else it's not going to be a smooth form. Do a recycle. Star through. So how do we make, after the pass of the ocean, how do we make the next call smooth for whatever it is? We can call swinging for her. Everybody pass the ocean. She's turning to her left on the pass of the ocean. If we now call swing through, it's the whole world falls, pass you swing through. She now has to come back to her right. It's fine for the guy, awkward for the girl. 
And if the girl does this all night long, past the ocean swing through, at the end of the night, she says, see, this just felt a little awkward. The, the dancers don't know why it doesn't feel as smooth. They're not callers, they're not analyzing this stuff. They just know how their bodies feel. Um, recycle, star through. So, of course, what this all is leading up to is, if you call past the ocean, insert a center's trade before whatever the next call is, and it'll be smooth in a second. Past the ocean, girls trade, see at the right, fell right in, and now you can call whatever you want to call. Now, I have one final point. I'm not, I'm not saying every time you call past the ocean, you must call center's trade. But what I am saying is consider one third of the time that you call past the ocean, insert a center's trade. Just one third, you don't do it all the time. Just a little bit, it'll make it a little smoother. Yeah, question. Yep, Marty North of Columbus, North Carolina. You could also have those centers stay stationary and have the ends circulate after you pass that ocean, then you can swing through comfortably. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. That's, girls are standing around. I want everybody moving. I agree, <laughs> that's, that's an alternate possibility. Yeah, if I was going to call past the ocean and boys circulate, then I would not call the center straight. Right. But you can have everybody circulate. All eight circulate. Yeah, oh, you say all eight circulate. All eight circulate. Yeah, you call you know, past the ocean and all eight circulate. Now that, that works well. The ladies are moving in that direction. I've just found it's even a little smoother if you insert the center straight because now. Remember, the circulate is a no hands call. So the center's train maintains the handle, maintains the flow. We have another question. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, ACDC works well. Yeah, ACDC. You should have written that call while you were on the uh, in the ocean waves. This related to some of the choreography that Barry did. If you do the swing through, and instead of say boys run, you say boys cross run. That momentum in the center should make it easy to do that, but that's virtually impossible in our dance world. Right. You can't call in to run, cross run, centers anywhere. Run. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 but is that related to, it's not related to momentum, it's related to dancer expectation. So you're saying on paper, the call past the ocean, hits cross run should be smooth? No, I was thinking of swing through where the, those centers are trading. Okay. The momentum should be make that cross run for the centers. Oh, okay, that's to, to be To be right. natural, but that's virtually impossible to call. And is that a, the, the lack of expectation of our dancer base? Pass, I mean, pass the ocean, no. swing through, and the boys cross run? No, that's just that's normal boys at the end, girls at the center swing through. Okay. The boys end up at the end of the swing through in the center. Right. If you said boys cross run, that's virtually impossible to call. In many, many. Oh, boys. I call that all the time. There's no problem with that. Well, you bring it around and you will, you will get boys. failure. You will get failure versus the boys run to the right. All I have, if I call swing through and the boys cross run, the first time I say it, I will add directional words to tell them where to go. So I would say swing through, boys cross run to the far end, and they'll all do it. And then we go on. And now the next time I don't have to say it. I agree. That's a momentumal issue. As Barry was talking about, the fact that the boys run right is, is the expectation. The boys cross run to the left is not an expectation. And you have to say to the far end, you have to get them there. Right. And, and I'm going to put the words cross in there loud, and I'm going to say it well before they... So it's a delivery issue and an expectation issue overriding the uh, body flow issue that gets us to the run. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Because there's more success in one way than the other, and it's the one that shouldn't work. It's, it's, it's a survival of the inferior product in the marketplace. <laughs> right. That's, the, the cross run should be a lot better, but uh, that's not where we went. Lynn Nelson, Kansas City, Kansas. I want to go back to something that Barry said earlier. I think it was Barry. Since we have a square room, the only thing that you can do from a wave after a walk-in dodge that's smooth is 
and chase right. Now, as the girl who's usually on that right and doing that U-turn back, I disagree. I'd like somebody to explain to me why that is considered smooth. Because I've never seen anybody call that and get it out of their mouth fast enough that I'm already turning as I'm moving to the right. I've taken that step over, planted my right foot, and now you want me to turn around on it. So explain to me how to make that call so smooth as everybody's telling me that it's supposed good, to be. Good timing. I, I, I mean, if you just, I'll dance to some really great callers if I get to, I mean, I go to the, to the Rio Grande Valley all winter long. We got some of the best down there. And I've still never danced it where it felt comfortable to me. Everybody do a single hitch. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a walk up from here, Greg. I'm going to say the word chase right when the boy is only halfway across and you're still finishing your slide. Walk and dodge, chase right. See, I don't even let you finish. See, you're right there. You hit me with a long skirt. I'm, I'm halfway there. You say it. I'm pivoting on that foot that I just planted. Her point is on the chase. See, that's you're already moving sideways. You're moving so I've got that right foot planted. And as I put it down, you say chase right. Now I have to twist on that knee to turn around. How is that how is that smooth? I think she's got a point. <laughs> Callers have been telling me for two years that's the smoothest thing to call after a chase ride. And I don't see let, let me give you a Mike Kessler. As a dancer, though, that right side dancer doesn't do a U-turn back. It's a it's a it's a kind of a small clover thing. It's what it is. Like a little peel. Yeah, so it is a peel. Yeah. Not on a dodge. Not on a dodge. Yeah, it, it, but but if you're if you're it's it's but the way the delivery is. It's walk and dots, chase right, and so you're just you're just getting that step going, and then you begin to peel. So the delivery is it is, it is the key right there. This this brings me to so we don't have too much time left, but this I, I wanted to sort of show this. One one of my pet peeves is that a lot of really nice flowing choreography is precluded because dancers aren't used to it. It's not that it's hard, it's just dancers aren't used to it, and we, we call it extended applications or something like that. Um, can I have squared up center? Okay. So, uh, head slide through. Square through three. Left touch one quarter. Walk and dodge. Wheel around. How did that feel? Dixie style little wave if you want. Element left your corner. How many people think that would survive on the average mainstream floor, which is all that was? How many think it would survive on the average advanced floor? <laughs> Seriously. You would have to now, feed wheel around ahead of time we in order to get them to do the wheel around. Wheel around is a perfectly nice call that we almost never use, so you can't use wheel around, right? Because we don't use it, we can't use it. It's like nobody's talking about square dancing because nobody's talking about square dancing. It's, it's a vicious circle. Yeah, but it is total body reversal for the left hand dancing. It is, but it, it still feels good. Another peeve of mine, as long as we're on that peeves, head swine through. Double pass through. Put centers in. What's next? Why? I like ends full. Because it flows well, and nobody thinks about what else could you do. So this is what I think of as, as a different type of overflow. We do this centers in, cast off three quarters, and that's all we ever do. And so the dancers get used to that, to the point where I play with floors with this. I'll say centers in just like I did, and just wait and see how many cast off three quarters I get. And then I'll, you know, say for those who haven't already cast it off three quarters, but then they get the idea that maybe something else could be done that would feel good. Hey Lee, just a minute. I'm talking this time, Lee. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was last night. How about this? Center's California twirl. 
cast off three quarters. Hands pass through. I mean, that all flowed. How well do you think that would go down if you just called it cold? So one of my challenges to people is take some of these trite combinations that we use all the time that the dancers will, you know, the ones where if you give the first call, the dancers will do it. Do the, the whole combination and think of something else to do. It's a new avenue into creative choreography. Thank you very much for... There used to be points of a diamond up there if they're dancing plus, and so a lot of them don't move. But then when you try and make the star, it's way the hell over there. So you need to teach them that they need to breathe inward to make the star comfortable, and then, and then turn. Thanks for the question. We are nice, nice, nice hand for Roland on has to our mic person. So thanks for coming. And uh, <laughs> the handouts are still at the back if you have any questions. Ed and I are happy to be assaulted in the hallway over coffee or whatever. <laughs>